Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's panel discussion on sustainability in the travel industry. Are destinations meeting the demand? It is my honor to have two distinguished panelists representing the various sectors of the tourism industry and a very strong commitment towards sustainability. As tourism has rebound and we are seeing many destinations have lifted their restrictions and continued travel is beginning to, to um, something that we are seeing at the moment, right? And so does our urgency to address some of the environmental impacts that we have seen even prior to the pandemic. Singapore, for example, has now um, committed as a global leader towards its commitment to its sustainability. And we are uh, implementing many initiatives, a comprehensive, I would say, and a forward thinking approach towards a sustainable future, particularly for the tourism industry. For example, uh, we have seen initiatives like Singapore's Green Plan 2030. We have also looked at the MICE and Hotel Sustainability Roadmap and a lot of other initiatives taken, especially by the events sector. So today, the panel here aims to explore the current state of sustainability within destinations worldwide, as well as to examine if we are really effective in addressing some of the problems towards sustainable and responsible tourism development. Uh, through this discussion, we hope that we could look at some of the key challenges, some best practices and initiatives, uh, as well as some of the opportunities that we could seize and leverage to bring, bring about a more sustainable future for our tourism industry. So uh, let's dive into this topic. And I would like to begin by introducing um, both our panelists and they will do a short one minute introduction of themselves. So I will begin with my really good friend and colleague, uh, Kevin, I know you are a diehard uh, in terms of pushing the agenda towards sustainability and responsible tourism. So I'll hear from you a little bit on your background, please, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Ke Kevin Poon and, and I started the Center for Responsible Tourism Singapore six, seven years ago. Um, I, I won't tell you my age, but my daughter just told me that um, you know in a few years' time I'll be half a half a cent century old. So um, I've been in the travel tourism sector probably for for all my life, and uh, I've uh, and at this uh, the, at the Center for Responsible Tourism we do training, teaching, and and some uh, consultancy work. Uh, right now I'm. I'm I'm involved in a, in a in a project here here in my country uh, that is um, trying to incorporate glamping into one of the green spaces. Um, yeah, so that's that's more or less what I do. All right. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Kevin. And we're going to hear a lot more about your own experiences in bringing about some of the best practices in our industry. So over to you, Asma. Some um, little bit of a sharing of what you do. Okay, sure. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Asma Azmani. I'm a sustainability solutions consultant uh, with NG Impact, where we advise clients on uh, building decarbonization roadmaps, uh, offsetting strategies, and we also develop um, like global solar programs. These are the main areas of my um, expertise. Um, I am originally from Tunisia, based in Brussels. And um, I'm also a solo traveler outside of work. I've been to 21st country. So here, this discussion is kind of like bridging the gap between two of my best words, sustainability as a profession and tourism as, um, as a, you know, like a hobby. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a Happy to be with all of you and very honored to be uh, with the discussion with you. Thank you. Our pleasure to have you both of you here on the panel. And I want to just kickstart a, a very important question. Um, you know, many countries are now trying to bring and revive tourism and bring uh, the tours as well as the tourism dollars back into our destination. So we see a lot of uh, marketing, lots of promotion that is being done towards bringing the tourists back to the countries. So, um, Kevin, let me just direct this question to you because you're also in uh, destination marketing. 
uh, as the demand for sustainable tourism continues to grow, and here there are destinations wanting to bring tourists back into their country in terms of numbers, right? So how can they strike a balance between tourism and at the same time preserving the natural and heritage ecosystem and you know uh, sustainability? Right. I think this is one question where we can probably spend the next few days trying to discuss. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was uh, there was a, a documentary on CNA shown, I think, in 2022 or the end of 2021, uh, where the, the the journalist was uh, she she made a trip. I I think it's May Wong. She she made a trip to one of the islands in Thailand and uh, where she spoke to a few people there, and uh, that. That was uh, probably at the start of 2022 or, or the tail end of 2021, where where travel was uh, just starting to be um, coming back. So what she what she what she learned and 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 what she saw was that um, while while much of the world could not travel, the coral reefs and uh, and the creatures out in in the sea thrived. You know. So uh, that is probably one of many many stories uh, that we could that we probably heard in the last two two and a half years. Um, what are the what are the how how do destinations and, and when we talk about the destinations, we are we are not just only talking about countries but cities, you know, um, regions. So how 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 can places strike a balance between? Um, at, at on one hand, still letting the the tourists coming in, and on the other hand, uh, trying to uh, trying to maintain this 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 very important but uh, very delicate, you know, the the balance of um, making tourism grow and but but at the same time not not have not not letting the the number of tourists uh, grow up. Up to the point where the the the, the local people and and the places uh, start to suffer. Um, I, I gave this question some some thought. We talk about this this question once in a while in in the classroom. I think one of the one of the things that quite a lot of places uh, have actually started to 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 do is to is to encourage and to uh, and and to start thinking more about partnerships. You know. Um, and when we when we say that we're talking about the government partnering the private sector oh. and uh, creating yeah creating in incentives for the private sector to to explore uh, part partnership um, so so I think partnerships have shown itself to be one of those things that that can uh, that you know that can uh, at the same time allow destinations and 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 companies to to uh, to share best practices uh expertise you know and uh, so when what, you say uh, uh yeah. collaborations and partnerships right kevin are you talking about you know uh where destination management companies or tourism boards work together with travel yeah. agents travel companies yeah you know, are you yeah, talking yes, about yes. working with a trade? Yeah. You know, the whole supply chain coming mm -hmm. together and being consistent in the way that they offer sustainable tourism experiences. Yeah, yes. Uh, there are actually quite quite a few points, um, but I, I chose to to just touch on this point about pa partnerships, um, partnerships, especially between the public and the private sector. You know, and we see examples in in quite 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 a lot of places um in in australia the the governments started to to partner with the private sector with the two operators and the the travel agencies you know yeah. uh where the the barrier reef um almost 40 percent of the barrier reef is now destroyed while travel tourism is not the 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 main not the only culprit um Climate change and and uh, and and the fact that uh, since it got the World Heritage Site status, which I think was about thirty plus years yes. ago, the the number of tourists going to to that part of the country has 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 gone up. So there's okay. uh, there's there's a lot of partnerships. You know, the funding comes from the states, 
while the private sector um, you know contributes the technologies and the expertise so they started doing things like um, you know um, developing the framework for the the, the capacity um, while the funding goes to to pay for conservation work that that goes in throughout the the uh, throughout close to to much of the year so yeah so while there are quite a few things associated to to this question um yeah. partnerships i think is is one of those things that we yeah. identified and uh, yeah uh, that that yeah. that places so think, are uh, yeah. a very important point that you have raised is that there is value in com countries or destinations uh, implementing sustainability strategies especially in the ecological systems and what is going to happen is that you know you see the the beauty of these destinations being revived and coming back and the travelers actually want to go to these cities or destinations where you see more beautiful things through sustainability you know and the actions that countries undertake to to you know make the great barrier reef better or even here in singapore you know some of these beautiful places have come up as important places of attraction because of our sustainability efforts so i want to direct this question to asma i suppose i'm, I'm sure you as a traveler as well as a consultant have seen some best practices being adopted by tourism organizations or tourism destinations can you share some of these best practices that have been recently seen in some of these destinations or companies? Sure. Um, that's a very good question. So um, through either like my travel experiences or my work as well, um, I think one, 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 one of the very um, best examples I want to share today is uh, there was a white paper that was developed by the work, uh, World Economic Forum can, um, uh, Tourism uh, no, Council for uh, Sustainable Tourism. They detailed 10 of the best principles that destinations can consider uh, when they develop their strategies. So I want to um, draw like dive deep into these and again, I'll provide examples of what's what what destinations they can um, take from them um, and then implement later so the first example is certify and monitor scientifically why is this important because now people they um, accreditation adds uh, like certification adds more credibility to the business so for me whenever I take a decision if I have if they have a two options to choose from I would go for the one who are certified more because this adds yeah. value to their business um, the drive for this is that destinations they have the key role of promoting these be these best practices to push the industry to adopt them uh, for travelers as they are making more informed decisions based on the, um, the sustainability initiatives they are forced for good to push the industry and then from the enterprise or corporate level um, CSR now corporate social responsibility has been one of the key topics um, many companies they've been adopting or uh, implementing CSR actions for moral reasons but, but other Others, they are uh, they've been responding to the investors' um, needs because CSR has been like sustainability has been one of the key um, KPIs that investors use when they make their decisions. Few examples here, for example, in Australia, uh, there is Ecotourism Australia, which is an eco certification um, certification that certifies companies working in nature and protected area with a strong implementation values uh, and the commitment to nature conservation. Another example is the UNESCO Sustainable Travel Pledge, which incentivizes the use of concrete measures to promote sustainable tourism practices and heritage conservation. So this whole thing has to deal with how much it's important to certify and monitor scientifically. Um, the second principle is um, cultivate the workforce why this is important because in the tourism industry we are talking about like 334 million jobs in tourism which is like a huge in terms of the scale so if you are educating these um this workforce empowering them capacity building and all of these things these people will be embodying the sustainability principles in the way they do their business it's going to be reflected in, in in their jobs and also first and foremost is gonna um somehow improve their quality of lives when we talk about travel, one of the challenges is the high seasonality where people have to work for long, extensive working hours with the very um, minimum wages. So if you are 
giving them the right and also activate the dialogue with with the different stakeholders through associations and collective bargaining so we we give them the possibility for them to feedback and all collaboratively you can build strategies that in um that give everyone the right to to be more um more active and sustainable um, the third principle is uh, prioritizing communities. So we all travel and we enjoy all of these interesting um, heritage sites or natural, um, you know, like yeah. uh, the, this garden or, or or conservation area or whatever. But like communities has always to be the main and has to be first because it's their land, it's their country, it's their property, it's their culture. So they have to be put first before anyone else. Prioritizing them actually like put like lay the foundation for shared values and sense of purpose, social license and um, legitimacy. Um, the fourth principle is align visitors. So visitors or tourists are, are the one who are driving the whole industry. So without informing them and teaching them or educating them about the sustainable tourism, we are missing a big part of sustainability. So they need to be uh, managed properly. We need to inform them about sustainability, whether whether it's like the, 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 the simple um, uh, welcome package booklet where you can inform them about few things of how they can have sustainable behavior while in that destination or by providing also them the options on choosing sustainable um, solutions as opposed to non-sustainable um, tours or activities. Yeah. Number five is uh, protect heritage. Here I think um, the UNESCO and the regulatory body has to play a key role on how they protect the heritage because it's one of the ep ep it's one of the epicenter of um, why people they do travel like some people travel for nature others they travel for heritage and culture so it's it's something that we need to protect and give our attention to the mass uh, to the maximum possible mm -hmm. um, number six is protecting nature um, nature and biodiversity is again one of the major things for which people travel it helps human well-being and this is, has been i think proved through covid on how many people they reported that when when being in nature it it, it improves their well-being and um their their psychology as a whole uh, it provides the potable water it provides um drink of, uh, no like uh, breathable um oxygen it is it is it is the i think like the um like nature is the mother of the whole thing. So I, for me, I, as, as a person, now I actually shifted my uh, my traveling pattern and I go mostly to nature resorts more than uh, more than any other type of um, right. activities. Right. Here, um, the thing is that like, we need to have more protected lands. So far, the number is kind of like disappointing as by far we have like in terms of ocean, we have only 7% of the ocean that has been protected, which is very yeah. disappointing as opposed when, when you see the damage that has been happened, whether it's like illegal fishing or the damage that happened to coral reefs or the deforestation and for, for the for the land things. Um, but 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 the good news is that um, at the end of 2021, around 77 countries, they agree on protecting around 30% of the ocean by 2030, which is a very promising number um, that yeah. is going to uh, bring back um, part of the ocean because first, um, it, it's a responsibility for everyone but coral reefs are one of the uh, strong carbon sinks they're able to capture carbon as a more than for example afforestation uh, yeah. but people most of the time they direct their attention more towards build like uh, planting trees rather than uh, sure. protecting coral reefs or mangroves Right. Um, so I just want to uh, pick up on a, a couple of things uh, before mm -hmm. we actually uh, discuss uh, the other points, you know. Yeah. Uh, one very important point that you mentioned about accreditation and certification, I think that's so critical because, uh, one, of course, it leads to, to, you know, to claim that you are sustainable of destination or you're a sustainable, eco-friendly organization if you don't have, a, you know, a, a valid uh, certification or accreditation, it can amount to greenwashing. And yep. I think our travelers are very uh, vigilant to that mm -hmm. sort of statements that we make, you know, that we are green or we are eco-friendly. So I always uh, advise in my consultancy work with the 
industry is that please be very mindful about the words you use and go for certification because yep. uh, that is so systematic. The consultants uh, with the certification come in with structure. And I'm sure yourself as a consultant and Kevin as a consultant would agree to that, you know, that mm -hmm. go for proper frameworks and systems because very often uh, destinations and uh, operators always ask me, like, where do I start? Where do I begin? And if you really want to do it professionally, I would mm -hmm. say go for certification before you make the claims, you know. Yep. And the yep. second point that you raised was equally very important that our our staff, our community, you know, when they are our ambassadors, they evangelize, you know, what is going on in terms of sustainability and what we so we don't if we don't uh, invest in our workforce and educate our employees it is going to be very difficult uh, to pass the the mindful messages or yep. what we call green marketing you know uh, carefully right to the yep. the visitors uh, and a third point and i want to direct that to kevin because um Kevin, you have been involved in training and capacity building of our industry uh, workforce. Uh, but at the same time, you know, um, in passing the educational messages to the traveler as well, you know. So it's important for travelers to be mindful. How do we uh, educate the end consumer, you know, of uh, being mindful when they travel? right what do we do to get more travelers to join us as an important stakeholder in so, bringing sustainability, in bringing sustainability. In our destination? kevin right uh and the last few years i'm trying to con convince my parents that you know there's a different way to travel so that, <laughs> that's a very apt question um how can destinations bring about the message to the the travelers uh, that there is a certain way to travel and the previous ways that they travel perhaps you know was not very responsible uh, not so re responsible to the places and uh, to the people that they come across you know in their stay uh at the places where they where they've been to um so i i I think one of the um, one of the one of the things we are starting to see more and more places do is to promote or to to market to brand themselves as a sustainable travel destinations and um, and we see that in uh, places like Kerala where the declaration for responsible tourism just took place two months ago or maybe one and a half months ago we see that in Cape Town where they um when south africa hosted the world cup football uh, in 2010 they were uh they were al already talking about responsible tourism uh, that is also because the uh the, the there was this cape town declaration on responsible travel um and that's i think that was in the early 2000s so so branding or positioning your your destinations and or or, or your country uh, as a sustainable or responsible to tourism destination seems to be something that is uh, kind of trending. Uh, more and more places are, are doing that. And we might see this country, we, we, we might see Singapore, you know, doing that. Um, if not us, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we will see more and more places. So that is one. Um, I think um I, I want to go back to the to the point that i was talking about in the first question uh that i that i uh that i that i took on that the point about partnering um we also do see that the government uh, will not be able to do everything alone you know in in uh, in trying to push uh the the agenda for responsible travel um no one works in in isolation so there's there's a lot of um yeah there's there's a lot of partnering between uh, in the private sector uh, there's a lot of partnerships between the the public and the private sectors uh so so you know there there's probably uh, some uh, some need for the government to to come in uh because they are the ones with the with the power they are the ones who have the authority uh you know there are places uh th there are places now um 
asma talk about protected areas uh, i think um the the land and the the, the water spaces in total now make up about 12.5 to almost 13 percent of the world's total surface is now considered um pro, uh, protected areas so we we um we are seeing you know uh, more and more cases where the, the public and the private sector come together to, to bring about the, the message. Uh, there's a lot that the, the traveller must know and, 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 and should know. You know, it's, it's not just about um, uh, trying to book the green hotel or, or trying to make sure that the, the airline that you fly with uh, has has offsets for carbon. While, while those one or two things are important and 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 useful you know i i think there's a lot that we must still send the the, the message across you know travel is a, is a process where it touches on quite a lot of things uh from the from the things you buy from the local shops uh to how they they, they make the things that you buy from the food that you eat uh to to how they cook it you know so to 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 keep my my answer short um you know, these are the, the the two things. Possibly, these are two things out of a range of 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 things, uh, ways and means where we can send this very important uh, um, note across, yeah, to 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 people who who travel. And and as you said uh, in in your statement when you started that uh, there are, there's just going to be more and more people who who will travel. Yeah, you know, one of the things, uh, it's quite interesting now, you know, I've always deliberated and we have spoken about this when I train and consult, is that sometimes it's choice editing a way to go forward. Because, you know, if you look at Taiwan, they have done away with amenities as a complete ban on plastic and amenities in hotel. That's choice editing. You don't give a choice to the consumer anymore. And that's part of the education process. But of course, you know, uh, you, you will get into another side of the debate where customers will say, well, I pay five star and expect quality service. And, you know, just because we go sustainable doesn't mean that there's a compromise on quality. And that's an important message that we need to give to consumers as well. So, uh, you know, it's an interesting debate to think about, should we limit the choices that we give to travelers today in the pursuit of sustainability? And what kind of message do we give when we are doing that, right? It's not just about saying no more plastic straws, but how do we get the message across so that the interpretation the mindful interpretation actually happens on the side of the consumer. So I, I think it's not something which is accidental, that it is so easy to implement an organization, but it requires a lot of training of how we train our staff to communicate the message. At the same time, how the consumers receive that information that educates them, you know. And I think it's a, it's a responsibility for us in the industry to think that, that we have a role and responsibility to educate the customer. You know, it's not just a provision of service, but we are in the role of now educating our consumer as well, you know. So um, it, there's a lot, a lot of uh, issues in there and, and barriers, but we'll come to that in just a bit. But Asma, I just want to ask you this question, you know, um, as much as we're giving choices for consumers today, right, uh, we are also witnessing sustainable innovation happening, like sustainable gyms, right, that are found in certain uh, buildings. And we saw that sort of... Uh, uh, innovation at the World Expo in Dubai. Um, technology is playing a really critical role in waste management, energy management, water management, right? Can you yeah. share a little bit in terms of some of the uh, examples where technology and innovation have been used to bring the carbon and ecological footprint down in destinations or organizations? Sure. Um, when, when you look at the technology and innovation in the tourism industry, like there is 
surprisingly very much like abandoned number of initiatives that has been already implemented or under research currently. I want to break down this into walking into different pieces of the tourism industry. So when we talk about tourism, the first thing is transportation, uh, whether it is land transportation or air transportation. One of the best thing I, I, um, I want to talk about is the sustainable aviation of fuels. So like now when, when you book all of the plan, like most of the airlines, they provide you with the option of of uh, offsetting your emission, but offsetting is actually it, it's a good as first step, but it's not it's not gonna solve the whole problems. Sustainable aviation fuels is one of the uh, main streams of um, it's one of the work streams where um, innovations is has been playing a key role. Why is this important? Because um, it provides alternatives to the kerosene and fossil fuels of uh, for fueling airplanes. It has the possibility um, for um, reducing the, the, uh, the emissions by 65% of the global aviation industry, which accounts for 2.5 of the global emissions worldwide. So it's a huge in terms of the impact that it's going to have. Uh, a lot of airplanes that have been investing in this um, technology uh, is like Turkish Airlines, United Airlines, um, Air, uh, Air New Zealand, and all either investing in the fuel themselves or, uh, or um, using them. Um, also, we have powered, um, battery powered crews in Norway, for example, when you go on exhibitions to see the, the North Pole or even Antarctica, actually, they're using this, which actually, um, like, they're kind of like moving away from the fossil fuels and adopting more um, green sources. So th this is, has to deal with, uh, with, with transportation. For the land, you will have like a charging infrastructure, public transportation, reliable, that, that are affordable and reliable. Um, moving now to the set to the section or sector of buildings and um, energy so most of the buildings they they use the lead certification which is leadership in energy management and environmental design uh, that um, certifies how efficient the buildings are which is one of the very good um, step I would say um, like accommodation properties they adopt in in order to reduce their emissions um, in terms of also renewable sourcing you have uh, one of the initiatives is that we have the power purchase agreement which is the highest in terms of additionality that uh, properties or companies they can have uh, to fuel their uh, electricity as opposed to buying from the fossil fuel uh, fueled um, grid electricity and in Australia um, NG has signed the power purchase agreement contract with the with the Australian New South Wales and Australian um, capital territory for 10 years to provide them with the green electricity. Um, a third bucket is uh, like the accommodation. This is my favorite thing. Um, be being a traveler, always look for authenticity and also looking for something that is, you know, like that not everyone, so something that um, you can't find anywhere else, you know. Uh, when, when, when we talk about accommodation now, there is a big movement of tiny houses. So people have been moving from uh, like the regular apartments and hotels and they go somewhere else into the um, nowhere to have uh, these tiny houses, which are surprisingly very energy efficient. Most of them, they're off grid. They rely on renewable energy, uh, solar panels coupled with, with batteries. Um, they live in communities with likely minded people because it goes way more beyond the building itself. It's, 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 it's a mindset that people want to embed by most these people. They care about the environment. So they, they, they understood the damage that people have been doing to the, to the environment and they want to take action. In, in their daily lives. So this is like one of the, my favorite thing. You have EcoCamp in Patagonia who are using the exact th same thing. Mashpee Hotel in Ecuador who, who, that was founded by, by an environmentalist who witnessed the damage that happened to the forest. So he bought the land and then he, he built this, this hotel, which is like, it's, it's a mind blowing. Like it is embedded into nature. In, in the rooms you have top like floor to, to roof um, windows where you where you are in the rainforest all of the activities are environmentally friendly they um they employ only local people they provide only local food so there is really like very promising like the initiatives that has been already done is is just mind-blowing yeah, um, yeah talking about that asthma I, I, I was actually uh staying in one of the tiny houses they just did that in singapore on the lazarus okay. islands a small island and it's amazing it's a totally new experience it's 
is it, yeah. I wouldn't say that, uh, you know, because uh, they they use solar panels and very limited amenities that it comes to. But I think it's worth paying for that experience, you know, yeah. of mm -hmm. uh, simplicity. And simplicity mm -hmm. has a price that we want to pay mm -hmm. for that sort of thing, you know, being yeah. in nature and mm -hmm. it's not noisy, but at the same time, you know, such a uh, an intimate experience with the yeah. nature, right? So uh, it's something that's just experimented here in Singapore. And I think, you know, given a choice, I would go for that sort of experience because yeah. it's not staying in a, a thousand room uh, mm -hmm. hotel, you know, and mm -hmm. It's amazing. I, I think there's a big demand for that. And what Kevin is doing, like, you know, glamping, right? Mm -hmm. Again, it's minimal, it's mm -hmm. simple, but yet, you know, we are willing to pay that sort of a price for yep. that sort of an experience, you know. But mm -hmm. I want to ask you a very important question, mm -hmm. Asma, because uh, whenever I do trainings on sustainability, this mm -hmm. question always pops up, you know, mm -hmm. is uh, going towards sustainability and the adoption of innovation and technology expensive? And can we even recoup the, you know, the, the can we even look at ROIs, right, over the long term yeah. or short term? You know, it's a big question in a uh, industry that is, you know, experiencing very narrow profit margin. So can you explain that? Sure. Um, why, well, sustainability doesn't mean that you will always pay expensive. There is always alternatives that are um, either at the same price or cheaper. And one thing, for example, here uh, in, in the electricity market, one of the main, um, my area of expertise, when we talk about like the power purchase agreement, which is an alternative to the regular uh, market, one of the key KPIs when we pitch this to clients, um, we look at, like we can, most of, Actually, all the times we provide prices that are cheaper than the electricity prices that they can be got from the, from the grid. So first, you are getting more sustainable and green sourcing, and second, you are financially making a profit. So it doesn't mean always that we are moving to sustainability. That's always gonna be have a financial implication and paying more. Um, on the travel, for example, um, for example, flying is obviously the in most of the cases where it's it's far, obviously it's most um, efficient, but doesn't mean that if you downgrade and using a train, it's gonna it's gonna like it has implications because most of, most of the time actually other means are more cheaper, like the shared mobility all the time are cheaper than flights. Um, so it, this is also another example. Um, construction, um, like for, for the accommodation, like tiny house. Yes, it's probably not the best example to give on um, on sustainability that uh, being affordable, I would say. Uh, but that's that's or like then for me, like the top niche of experiences that you would have, same as going to Antarctica exhibitions, um, same as uh, you know, like uh, having all of these fancy crews and all. So. Um, for me, like the shorter response is that for sustainability doesn't going to sustainability doesn't mean that we are paying more all the time. It happens a few times, but now more businesses are looking at alternatives that are more affordable and they have a shorter like return on investments. And then the, the tourists themselves, they don't they want they won't be in a position to pay for for these decisions on moving to sustainable, because if in all the times, if if it is sustainable, few people, if it is more expensive, only few people will will go for it, but most most of the people they want. So we want to have the possibility to provide sustainable options that are affordable, that people can choose other than uh, going to other directions. Right, right. So thank you, Asma. And and a, a related question is this, you know, and, and maybe Kevin can chip in here, because, you know, um, the the options, although you know, we we when we look at sustainability, well, we look for cheaper options, and all the initial investment is going to be there. And we are really serious about moving towards sustainability. We've got to spend money towards that. You know, I give you an example: is Bhutan, right? I work very closely with Bhutan, and when they had a commitment towards you know sustainability, they have got sustainability development fund, right? And it went up. Uh, uh, by a substantial amount recently and of course the industry was very upset and angry and travelers were also you know uh, feeling the pinch of traveling into Bhutan but they continued with a commitment that they want to ensure that they are not targeting mass tourists but at the same time they wanted to funds to go into sustainability a big challenge a big barrier for the government 
as well as the tourism operators or the collaborators or the partners in the tourism ecosystem. So, Kevin, tell me a little bit about what you think about strategies like this. And Bhutan is not the only one. There are other countries that are contemplating putting a tax or a fund for sustainable development, which can act as a barrier. And what are the barriers have you heard uh, in your consultancy work that destinations or companies in our industry face to implement sustainability? That's three questions, right? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I think um, Venice, contemplated having a tourist tax which i think was shot down um and then they had they 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 were thinking about doing one or two other things and um uh very recently sorry it just slipped my mind um all of a sudden there was something that the the the, the city did did uh, a few months ago um which uh, which is probably what we call one of the strategies when it comes to trying to make make travel more sustainable and um so i think not every destination can have the the, the luxury like bhutan to 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 think about such a, such a move um there's always this fear that oh if we levy such a such a charge and such a uh, quite quite a high charge you know um we there could be this loss uh there might people there might be some people who will who will change their mind and go some somewhere else and i think this this fear is very real you know but um there are pros and cons i think on 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 one side there is this very staunch the message that the destination is trying to send across to the travelers and with within the destination itself you know seems to be very clear and loud that uh, you know we we do not want to see the kind of uh the, the kind of mass mass travel that we see in in quite a lot of places it, it could be pain but it is just something that um that that people have to have to get used to yeah. um yeah so your second question uh the the barriers and the challenges when it comes to executing or Im- implementing sustainable tourism, what are some of the challenges and, and the barriers that, that des- destinations face? Um, we, we sometimes have this notion that uh, trying to be sustainable or trying to practice sustainable tourism can be expensive. And I don't think that this notion or this fear is unfounded. You know, you, 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 you need to put in the financial resources um, because sometimes you might need technologies that are new and uh, you will have the the situation where the scale uh, you know where a small small operator might not see the the ROIs yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah. so so um, one of the things that that um, that is taking place now is uh, is uh, you know um, there is now this uh this this shift when people talk about the returns on in investments you know the rois traditionally when we look at this word we always think about the the dollars and the cents but but there is now a stronger and stronger uh business case if if you like you know the rois or the the understanding of this term has now uh incorporated things like the image and the reputation of the company yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. So when when we shift the way we we look at this word, uh, suddenly we 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 are starting to see that there's probably more of a more of a case. Um, I I th- I think there's so many uh, there's so many things that we, we that we can talk about. That the challenges that one place faces could be different and similar to another to another. You know, uh, so I, I I would just um, give you maybe one more point uh, because this this question is is actually quite quite a quite a you know um, it it can lead to a discussion where we can talk about quite a number of things. But one one more point that I would like to to bring up is um, you know the demand for sustainable travel experiences will probably will probably not end so soon. 
because 10 years ago we talk about this this kind of travel and then and then 10 years on now we talk about this kind of travel and then um as we as we spend the next 10 years uh 10 years on in 2030 we will be talking about some some other kind of of uh, travel ex experience you know um we are now starting to see more and more places talk about these things that the boy scouts talk about many many years ago uh making leaving places better than when you when That's you uh, when you found when you went there and uh, this term regenerative travel suddenly is uh, is one term that uh, people uh, that people are starting to talk more and more about uh, and it's not mainly or only because of the pandemic um you know in in the last five six years there are people in in the west who who, who started to to talk about it uh in in philippines and i think in malaysia and in the philippines and to a certain extent in in thailand uh, they have uh, started to look at things that are parallel or similar to 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 this idea you know let travel be able to regenerate places yeah. and and Make yeah and 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 the lives of the of of the people there yeah so that's uh, that's yeah. my yeah. second point yeah yeah you know uh kevin you you talk about the trend uh increasing and in different forms are happening what we are also seeing now is with the rise of the uh the gen z's you know first was the millennial the gen z's it's a woke generation and you are seeing the notion of conscious consumption you know conscious travelers um an increasing trend at the moment, you know. So yes, I think it's going to grow. It's not going to end, but it's going to grow. And uh, Asma, I just want to direct this question towards you. When we talk about being conscious, you know, as a traveler, our faith, you know, the Muslim faith has always been advocating towards, you know, or against waste, whether it's waterways, food waste, and the need to be respectful towards local communities or any humankind, animals, right? Um, in a sense, it, we've always been advocating for, 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 for such dimensions of the human nature, right? So uh, with the rise of the Muslim traveler by the billions, right? How can destinations market themselves to appeal to the demand for sustainability by the Muslim travelers. Okay. Um, yeah. So I think here it's two sided things. So the first thing is how destinations can um, offer services, um, activities, or anything that is appealing, as you said, to the Muslim communities. And on the other side as well, um, there is also. Um, capacity building for, for, for the Muslims, because like comparing the different generations now, um, sometimes I would say like Gen Z um, are not exactly following what is supposed to be in terms of like be, being like, you know, like uh, following the Islamic um, rules and expectations. Um, so here I feel like um, I think it has to play with the country itself. So um, not not all the countries are actually aware of of this. And I, for example, as a, I, I as a, a female Muslim traveler, most of the time, um, unfortunately, I'm very disappointed about the services offering um, to us. So uh, you you would pay like tons of money and then going to other destinations, and then you will end up with very very limited options because we are not considered in the strategies where when when they built it um probably like the um, I, I think like the best examples they are considering the muslim needs are maybe in apac the gulf countries some in like south africa it has been where, one of the very good destinations uh but all the others i feel like you yourself need to do the work in educating them on what you are on, on what what you need at, at at least like the uh at the beginning and then they will consider this as a feedback and then they can they they, they use it to build their strategies. Uh, so I think that there is a lot of work that needs to be done from the destinations. Um, and here it goes way more beyond the sustainability, but more of like the Muslim needs on what they're expected, especially if you are, because now like we have more like a bigger, like purchasing power of the Muslims are increasing more and more. And we are seeing them um, as making up 
a big chunk of the um, travelers. Uh, so if you are having this, this community travelers, then you, you need to make sure that you are offering them the services they need and tailoring to their, to their needs in every single way. Um, and then now coming back to the second side of things uh, about Muslims, I think they also need to play a better role in, in, um, in, like following the, the, the Islamic, uh, you know, like um, guidelines in terms of not wasting, you know, like one of the things is like not wasting um, uh, water, even if you are on the side of the river, this is like a say of the of the prophet. Uh, so we, we need to, you know, like to encompass all of these um, principles in the way how we treat in the way how we treat the destination whether it's uh it's 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 it's, it's people whether it's the nature whether it's the culture so i think just embodying the islamic principles in the way how we behave is gonna have a, a impact on us on the community on the destination we have and also on the destination um to, to take more active roles on embodying this and in considering them when they build um, their strategies to kind of like uh, build something that responds to the need of the Muslim um, travelers. Right, right. Thank you. And uh, as a closing question, I want to have uh, both your thoughts just under one minute, maybe. Uh, what is one emerging trend that you see or foresee in sustainable travel landscape? Right? And how can destinations prepare for that one emerging trend? Kevin. Well, I was hope, hoping that I'll be the second one, so I got more time to, to think. <laughs> <laughs> Asma what? just finished the last question, so I'm giving you yeah, a yeah. <laughs> One emerging trend that destinations, one emerging trend that we see uh, increasingly Reforcing. common in, in uh, destinations. Uh -huh. uh, we are starting to see more and more places realizing that travel tourism is uh, is uh, not just a very big industry, but it it is sort of a solution, or if that word is too strong, uh, a facilitating plays a plays a facilitating role and an important role in uh, helping places um, fulfill the SDGs. You know, uh, there is so much connection between travel tourism and all the 17 goals not just a few not not just some but all the 17 goals from uh, no poverty to hung no hunger education all the way to the last one which is partnership and in between you have one or two goals that talk about global warming and climate change and life on land life beneath the water so every seven each of the 17 goals touches um and the, the the faster the the faster and the better destinations and policy make, makers see that there's so much about travel and traveling as an activity as an industry that can touch and uh, play some kind of very meaningful role uh, you know how we see travel which is already changing we'll see a, a a greater change and this greater change is for the positive you know Good. yeah Good. yeah Good. So basically what you're saying is that uh, as more and more countries realize that we have a great potential in meeting all 17 SDG goals, and that is something that is going to make destinations more competitive, but also at the same time, uh, consumers who are now exercising their choice in terms of which destination that I want to go to, I want to be more aligned towards destination that align themselves to the SDG goals. So thank you, Kevin. And as for what are your thoughts under one minute? <laughs> okay. Um, one of the things that I I found very interesting, um, now there is so many um, exhibitions that goes to Antarctica, which is something that not, not people that used to think about. This thing, one one it's one of, one of them, for example, the Antarctica 2041 uh, founded by Ro Robert Swan, who is the first person to walk to the north and southern pole it's, he's, he's an incredible environmentalist so they take people to the antarctica for um mostly it, like uh, educational purposes so that they see with their eyes on how climate change has been heavily impacting the environment whether it's rising eye, uh, sea level whether rising temperature like shrinking eyes and all of these things so these people after when they came back to their environment they will play the key role of being um environmental champions where they will somehow 
um, influence the their closed environment all the way to how much the extent they could have in terms mm -hmm. of impacting the decisions, uh, which I find to honestly very interesting uh, way of um, engaging the um, like millennials, Gen Z, or anyone who cares about the mm -hmm. environment in a very innovative um, way of like dealing with the teaching them about the sustainability and taking active actions. Great. I, I think it's a brilliant point because you're talking about immersive experiences. And mm -hmm. so if we as destinations or tour operators, you know, can design such immersive experiences with with an educational element in our mind, right, we would have more and more of these conscious travelers, meaningful uh, travelers who are seeking a meaningful tourism experience or even a regenerative tourism experience. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they could be more geared towards adopting these sort of experience or paying a value for such experiences. So yeah, I, I personally see that this is a big emerging trend and uh, those who could do it intelligently will be able to leverage on the, the, the rise in the market yep. segment for that, such an experience. So uh, with that, you know, we have uh, come to the last uh, couple of minutes. So it's for me to thank both of you for this highly engaging and interactive and such a valuable session. You know, I personally enjoy uh, conversing and, you know, just picking on people's brains and what can be done? You know, what, what are we doing? What can we do better? What's being done in different parts of the world? So thank you so much. I'm so sure that our listeners would really benefit from this interactive session that we had. So with that, thank you so much and good luck to both of you in the pursuit of something so important that both of you do and that's sustainability. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank for you. All of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.